Hey, today we have Jeffrey Goldstein with Onward Global. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jeff. How's it going? Sure, good. Thank you so much. So give me a little bit of background on Onward Global. I'd love to hear how you got this company started, what was the genesis for it, and kind of like what made you take that leap? Now, Onward Global is, uh, I've been China based for 11 years now. It's where I've really developed uh, my career. I started Onward Global about five years ago. And essentially Onward Global is an independent contracting practice uh, where I help U.S. startups, brands, and retailers manage and scale their sourcing, manufacturing, and ethical compliance, uh, not only in China, but throughout Asia. I'm not an agent. I'm not a middleman. I'm really a contractor. So CEOs and COOs really consider me part of their team throughout our engagement, whether that's short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And I work across a variety of different product categories, both consumer goods and industrial goods, and can really be hands-on in all aspects of supply chain, product development, and procurement operations. Got it. Thanks for the background. If you had to kind of give two or three reasons why you're different than a lot of the competition, because obviously importing and exporting from China is a huge space. Um, you know, what is it? What makes you different? I, I really don't position myself to be a middleman. I think a lot of companies in the consulting or sourcing or supply chain space who are helping American brands and retailers and startups here in Asia, they introduce themselves to suppliers and other third parties as uh, the third party. Uh, where everyone in the supply chain knows that headquarter or the U.S. company is hiring this third party to represent them. The way I operate uh, when I'm introducing myself on behalf of clients to all different parties, whether it's suppliers, logistics, or other parties, is I am part of their team. So everyone really sees me as a staff member uh, representing and as a decision maker on behalf of headquarter. So you've been doing this for a while. How did you get started in this space? I actually, I started my career on Capitol Hill and in consulting in the U.S. after graduating from the University of Denver. And a big part of my responsibilities at the time with those companies was really engaging executives all over the world. And having been born in France myself, spending time in the Middle East throughout high school and college, studying abroad as an undergraduate student in China, I've really always felt quite international. And so there reached a point when I was working in the US in a cubicle, engaging all these executives all over the world, where I said, wait a minute, I don't wanna be in a cubicle. I wanna be one of those guys or one of those gals, you know, out doing awesome things around the world. So the best opportunity that I identified at the time was to come out to Asia, uh, to China, and to work with quite a large U.S. sporting goods company uh, servicing the mass market. And I really I was fortunate to be mentored and to work and scale myself up, uh, up the operation uh, to the point where after six years of working with the company, I oversaw about, uh, about $35 million in procurement throughout Asia overseeing a staff of 15 people, overseeing the management of about 35 factories in China, Vietnam, India, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, and Bangladesh. And so working for that company for about six years, overseeing sourcing and manufacturing operations really is where I got the experience, fell in love with the industry, fell in love with this career, and was inspired to then start my own business onward global. Very cool. So when you made the move from the U.S. to China, um, walk me through that. Like, what were your fears? How did you feel? Did you ever kind of question if it made sense to go all the way across the Pacific? Well, it's funny. You know, at the time uh, in high school and college, I spent a little bit of time in the Middle East. And when it came time for study abroad, I remember going home and, and telling my father, hey, you know, everyone's going to study abroad. They're going to surf in Australia. And my dad being like, oh, heck no. And I was like, all right, well, you know, I've got some other friends that are going to Italy to learn how to cook. And my dad was like, definitely not. So we were kind of brainstorming, like, all right, well, where can we go? And China obviously was the fastest emerging market, the biggest opportunity, what everyone was talking about. So I decided to come out to China. And I think the thing about China, you know, whether you're a college student, 
or a business executive and you come out here, people either very quickly fall in love with it, with the challenge of it, with the adventure of it, with the difference of it, or they very quickly realize, oh my God, get me out of here. And so I, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with um, you know, the, the politics, the history, the culture, and really the challenge of just being you know, a white boy in the wild, wild east. <laughs> so, so you worked for a company, you got some experience, and then you decided to start your own company. Um, walk me through that leap. So when you were like, okay, I'm going to go out on my own and figure this out and run my own business, you know, what was that first year like? What were the ups and downs? It was fate in a way. I mean, I, you know, I'm so fortunate. My, my career with starting my business has only scaled up, and I just feel so fortunate with everything. And I'm thankful for it every day, and I'm sure to remind myself. But it was fate. When I left my old company, actually, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. And I knew I wanted to leave the company. I knew I wanted to do something new. And so I told myself, all right, you know, for the next six months, I'm just going to network. And actually, at the time, I was thinking about changing industries. I wanted to maybe do something different. So I said, for the next six months, I'm going to move around to different cities throughout China and just network. I'm going to go try to meet people from Starbucks to Walmart to law firms to VC companies to accounting firms to, to small startups to e-commerce companies. And I'm just going to try to meet executives, learn about different industries, network. And, you know, maybe I'm going to realize that I'm passionate about something or maybe I'm going to meet the right person. And about halfway through that process, and by the way, the process I just defined, I highly recommend for anyone, you know, in their early stage of their career, kind of just taking a risk and time stepping back, realizing what you learn up to one point and then saying, all right, maybe, you know, I need to learn about a different industry or, or meet different types of people. But about halfway through that process, I had a few contacts in the U.S. reach out to me and say, you know, Jeff you're in China right now. I know you're not working full time. I'm actually having a problem in my supply chain and I need a man on the ground. So during that six month period that I was networking and, and trying to figure out my life, if you will, my quarter life crisis, uh, I started taking on these, these small consulting projects and I really became the man on the ground. And that inspired me to start Onward Global, realizing that, you know, there are so many startups and brands in the U.S. that either don't fully understand their operations out here in China, don't want to get on a plane and come out here to try to figure it out. Even when they do come out here and figure it out, they buy a plane ticket, they travel all over China, they don't really fully understand the culture or the supply chain or much, so they're kind of wasting money. This is an opportunity in, in itself. And so starting the company Onward Global kind of started organically and, you know, out of faith. And I, today that's kind of my slogan. I'm your man on the ground or in the air. That's a great one. Um, so you mentioned that you, the advice that you kind of gave to people listening would be to kind of explore opportunities and see what you like and what you don't like. Was there any advice given to you that has really helped you along your way? Networking is just so important everything everyone does, especially as a startup or as a company owner. And in today's world, networking is, I'm not going to say easy because everyone's different, but right. uh, with the technology and the tools we have today, such as LinkedIn, you can, you can reach out to anyone in the world. And it's interesting, you know, the average person, they say, all right, you know, I'm really interested in reaching out to company A. And the first person they think about is, God, wouldn't it be great if I could reach out to the CEO or the COO and say, but no way, the CEO is never going to respond to me. So I guess I'll reach out to a mid-level manager, or I guess I'll reach out to, to the HR manager. But nine out of 10 people are thinking that way. Mm -hmm. And if you're the one out of 10 person, it's like, eh, you know what, I'm going to take a chance and I'm going to try to reach out to the COO and ask the guy for a cup of coffee. You'd be surprised at how many positive replies you actually get. And, um, you know, so I think that the piece of advice that I would give someone is, you know, when you're networking, reach for the top and, you know, keep trying.
Yeah, that's good. I think showing genuine interest in someone or their company is a, a really good way. And I agree, you got to shoot your shot. If you don't ask, you don't get, and you might as well start at the top because that can accelerate your learnings pretty quickly. What, what I found is that senior people in their careers like to talk about themselves Yep. and like to talk about their experiences. And what I found is that when you approach an individual at a C level, you know, uh, as a CEO, CFO, COO, and you know, you're not necessarily asking for a job or anything. You're actually asking to learn from them, and you're saying, "Look, you know, I'd appreciate, I'd really appreciate 15 minutes of your time just to learn about your career development and your experience." And I found that a lot of the time, if you if you position your request like that, they'll say, yeah, yeah, sure. Good. Let's go have a cup of coffee. I'll tell you all about me. And then after they tell you all about them for 15 minutes, they say, oh, well, what about you? What are you doing? What are you interested in? What do you want? And that kind of opens up those door and that networking in a much more you know, natural and, and genuine way. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think it just goes back to showing interest and kind of not putting them on a pedestal, but making it sure that you are explaining that you're really interested in their career. And if you can cite something maybe from their LinkedIn or Twitter profile or find a news article, that can really help you kind of cut through the noise. They do get messages, um, but most people are just kind of sending templated stuff to them. So that's great advice. Um, so tell me more about the supply chain issues in China. I know we know with the last year, things have been kind of crazy and the e-commerce space is exploding. Uh, what do people who are in the U.S. Uh, not know about what's going on right now with supply chain issues in China? You know, China is such a large, dynamic, diverse, uh, and fast-changing country that the situation on the ground here can literally differ on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, so, I mean, wh where to start, <laughs> right? I, I, I think, um, you know, if you're a small company owner or a, an emerging, you know, or fast-growing e-commerce company, I think it's, it's hard at the beginning, and, you know, this includes some of the clients I've worked with, it's hard at the beginning to, to allocate money towards coming out here and trying to figure out your supply chain. You know, you meet a few factory, what you think are factories or trading companies on the internet. You say, all right, the samples look good. The first 500 units shipped pretty well. You know, we feel good about things. But as you start growing your business, a factory or a company that maybe made 500 units very well may not be able to make 2,500 units. A factory that's financially stable today may not be financially stable tomorrow. So personal relationship management and really being able to verify who you're working with out here is just so important. Things are really changing on the ground here every day. Um, That's so even, even though clients hire me to be their man on the ground, one of the first things I tell them is, look, even if I'm your man on the ground, at some point, you got to get your butt over to China to really know who you're working with, where your production's happening. Are you happy with it? You know, and if not, we obviously need to develop a plan to, to change that or to scale that uh, to make sure it's going to meet your needs in, you know, six to 12 months as your company grows. China really is, continues to be the, the wild, wild east. Everything from our cultural business practices, how we define good and bad, black and white, what the gray zone is, is just so different in the U.S. and China that it's so easy for, for challenges and issues to arise if you're not really hands-on in, in managing your operation. So it sounds like one of the things that you can really help with is you can help um, companies avoid a lot of like amateur mistakes that you would make if you didn't know what you were doing coming into China, which could obviously cost you a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, but also you have a Rolodex or you know who to work with and that helps to kind of accelerate their process of working with China. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. I just wanted to kind of clarify that a little bit. And then um, going back to the supply chain issues, uh, one thing that I'm aware of is that costs have increased. Can you give me some examples of like how things price wise have changed? Because there's a lot of talk about inflation and then supply constraints in the US. Um, you know, I think it'd be interesting not only for consumers, but business owners to know what have you seen on the ground as far as pricing and why there is a huge increase? Well, there's a few things that's ha that has happened in the last year. I mean, Obviously, the purchase of personal protective equipment has created 
such a vast amount of production here in China and a need around the world that uh, there's so much shipping going on that there's a lack of containers available. So with so many containers leaving China and so much demand for these containers and so little of the containers actually returning to China because the global economy is still kind of on pause right now. And I don't have the number in front of me, but it's, I mean, the, the number of containers that actually, even pre-COVID, come back to China is very, very little. So there's always a, a shortage of containers here in China. And so right now, with the increased demand and with the global economy starting to pick up, everyone's fighting for containers. Whereas a container, you know, shipping from Shanghai to Los Angeles, maybe three years ago, costs about $2,500 to $3,000. Right now can be between $9,000 to $12,000. Wow. So if you're an e-commerce company or a small startup, that's really digging into your cash flow and your, and your financial management. The other thing is, you know, in terms of raw material costing, because the global economy is now starting to pick up and production is starting to pick up. And also, you know, it's interesting because the global economy is still on pause. Uh, so a lot of the manufacturers in Turkey, South America, even in the U.S. have not been able to produce what the consumer, what the consumers need. So a lot of middlemen and trading companies have turned to China to manufacture. So there's even higher demand in China. And the cost of raw materials like plastics and metals have just gone up significantly the last few months, which obviously is going to impact, you know, the pricing of product as well. So again, as a small startup owner or an e-commerce supply uh, purchaser, if you don't have strong contracts in place or strong relations with your suppliers to really help manage that consistency and sustainability in your pricing, you're going to find, you know, a lot of challenges in being able to, to meet the needs of your consumers and your procurement operations. And then, so price has gone up. Um, how does lead time look now? Has that changed? Lead time has absolutely changed as well. Um, again, you know, it really depends on product, region. But I could tell you, you know, for something like apparel or bags or shoes, usually you're looking, you know, pre-COVID at a 60, 75, 90 day time frame from the time you place a PO to your shipment leaving China. Today, it's closer to 75 to 90 to 120 days. Oh, wow. So you, you definitely need to be planning for that. The other thing that's happened in China, you know, minimum wage prices have gone up in China uh, and continue to rise quite large. And so it's getting more and more expensive for factories to have, you know, a large labor force. So what's happened is the size of the factories actually has reduced. And whereas, you know, you may have a factory who five, six years ago, maybe had two or three or 400 sewers. Today, that factory probably just has 75 to 155 sewers. Oh, wow. I had no uh, because idea. It, because it's so expensive to, to manage all that staff. And so production capacity is smaller in that factory, which obviously impacts your lead times. But it not only impacts that, but when a buyer places a very large order, they don't have enough space in their factory. So many times they have to use sub factories. Hmm. And when they're using sub factories, most of the time, they're certainly not telling the buyer. Okay. That's another good insight. Um, and, and so when they're using sub factories, that really becomes one, an ethical issue. What kind of sub factories are they using? Uh, but two, it can also create quality issues because if they don't have a good quality management system, the quality at their main factory versus the sub factories that they're using may all be different. And that means the product quality consistency that you're getting may be different as well. So again, it's really important to just have a good relationship with your supplier. Uh, come out here to China to really oversee as much as you can when you can or to have you know, a man on the ground who can do that on your behalf. So you mentioned going out to China. What do you think would be the minimum amount of time that you'd have to dedicate to get things started? And I know that's probably a tough question, but maybe, you know, just ballpark it. So people have an understanding if they're looking to start a new brand. You know, with the internet today, I think you can do a pretty good job of 
identifying suppliers online um, and at least starting that relationship of, of getting company profiles, getting quotations, getting samples. Um, and I think that's probably what most, you know, small e-commerce brands do. They, uh, you know, in my experience, most e-commerce companies don't actually come out to China until well after they place their first, you know, $200,000 and they start making enough money to actually purchase a flight out here. Do you think that they should be coming out before to connect with the suppliers before they make that 200,000? I think it really depends on how technical and how sophisticated of a product it is, you know, and what kind of quality you're, you're looking to meet. If it's a very technical product that really requires you know, your, your own designers and engineers getting involved, maybe it's worth flying them out here to work closely with the factory. If it's a very high price product where your risk is going to be even higher, if you're placing, you know, a 2000 or 5,000 unit order and you have the cash to come out here and do it, I would certainly advise coming out here. I mean, I would not come out here before you even start the process. Cause if you just hop on a flight out here and you're like, all right, now I'm going to stay at the, shared in a hotel for a week as I try to figure it out. I mean, that's going to cost you $2,000 right there. Right. So I would right. start that process in the U S you know, try to identify three or four vendors and then come out here and go vet those vendors. You know, sourcing is like sales in many ways. You've got to throw your net out and, you know, for every hundred prospective, you know, clients that you, you may find out of those, you know, maybe only 50 are going to even, reply to your email. Out of those 50, only 25 are going to be actually interested in meeting. Out of those 25, only 10 are actually going to show up. Out of those 10, you know, and the numbers just trickle down. And sourcing is the same thing for every one good factory that you're going to identify. And what I mean by good factor is really a long-term good manufacturing partner. You know, you've got to throw the, the net out there and you, you, it may take you going to visit or going to work through two or three different factories to find that supplier. Oh, wow. The other thing is, you know, when you're identifying suppliers, there's a lot of trading companies in China. There's a lot of factories. There's a lot of factories who make shoes, but will tell you that they make pillows, <laughs> but they're really not, you know, they're making it at their uncle's pillow factory or at a sub factory, or they're not even in that business, but they just got a random call from a guy in the U S saying, Hey, can you make this? And they say, sure, I sure. can make it. How do you avoid that? Or how do you notice that? It's hard. You know, you, you've got to hire someone or come out here yourself. Really. I, I, I hate to, to say there's no other way, but I mean, anyone who's done business in China will tell you, that if you're not verifying who you're working with and where you're working and how you're working, at some point you're going to get burned. Right. Yeah. Um, it seems like that's, you know, a, a, a everyone knows that when you receive a beautiful company profile from a factory or from a trading company, more than half the time, it's just too good to be true. Yeah. No, that's, that's good to know. I mean, there's a lot of great insights for people who are getting started and then people who've been in the industry. Um, for a while. So I only have a few more questions. Um, what's your one-year goal and your three-year goal for your business? So I've recently, you know, with COVID, it's interesting with COVID, while I have not been able to travel to different countries, obviously U.S. companies, you know, every COO in America and Europe right now is thinking, all right, what, what's our one, three, five, 10-year goal? And what's happening with China right now? You know, are these political tensions going to continue to increase? So Companies are looking to minimize their risk. They're looking to learn about different supply chain markets and they're looking to diversify. And so one thing I've started to do is I've started to build an infrastructure in terms of staff and network in different countries. That includes Vietnam, Cambodia, India, and Bangladesh. And uh, all countries that I've worked in and manufactured in before, but I'm really now starting to invest in, in building out teams and infrastructures there. And so that, that's probably where I'm going to continue to, to focus on for the next year and three years, really formalizing my service offerings in those markets and countries, as opposed to primarily being China-based. Very cool. Um, and then as far as business books, uh, do you read any? Do you have any that you would recommend or any books in general? You know, that, that's a good question. I'm really not the kind of guy that reads Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Tim <laughs> Cook kind of books. <laughs> 
Um, I'm kind of a, a geopolitical and, and history guy. So I'm not too sure the interest for your viewers, but um, you know, th there's obviously a lot out there and. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then as far as tools that you use in your day to day, is there any software that you love? Um, anything that you would recommend? I'm a, I'm a simple email uh, and Excel and Word kind of guy. Um, I, I think that's, you know, I, I think for these large multinational corporations, I know that they're, they're investing and in, in using different types of tools, but for the kind of work that I'm doing and the kind of clients I work with, you know, we're, we're keeping it pretty simple, which has been the most efficient and effective. Got it. And then last question, how can people connect with you if they wanted to uh, chat with you or do business with you? Sure. I appreciate it. Uh, my website is onwardglobal.com and the easiest way to reach out to me is on the website in the contact page. Uh, there's an easy way to write me a message or people can contact me at Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y at onwardglobal.com. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Sure, Joe. Thanks a lot.